Good afternoon and welcome to today's Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research webinar. For technical assistance, please phone Redback Support on 1800 733 416. Today's webinar is presented by Michael Salter. Dr. Michael Salter is a Scientia Fellow and Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of New South Wales. His research is focused on child abuse and gendered violence, including primary prevention, complex trauma, and technologically facilitated abuse. Today, his presentation, Constructions of Complex Trauma and Implications for Women's Wellbeing and Safety from Violence, will focus on the findings of a two-year ANROS-funded study examining current understandings and responses to complex trauma. To ask Michael a question, please use the Navy hand icon on the top right hand side of your screen. Without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Michael to begin. That's great. Thank you very much, Jason. And thank you also to the center for the invitation to come and speak to you today. And thank you all of you for, for registering and, and for logging on. Um, it's really great to see the, the interest that this research project has generated. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge just all of the other investigators on this project. It's been quite a big project and quite a challenging project to um, recruit women with complex trauma and professionals across two states. Um, and so there's been um, a really um, strong, um, strong team on this project, and that includes um, Elizabeth Conroy and Jackie Burke and Kaya uh, and also Jane Usher um, at Western Sydney University, um, Molly Dragowitz at Griffith, um, and we've also had Beatrice and, and Cheryl providing really important research assistance on the project. Um, Warwick Middleton as well, who's um, a psychiatrist, a professor of psychiatry based um, up, in, up in Brisbane. So I really uh, just want to emphasize that they're all uh, here in spirit, uh, even if they're not here uh, digitally. So um, you might ask why a criminologist is studying complex trauma. Um, I'm, um, I do a lot of work, particularly with, with women with complex trauma and women with dissociative disorders. Um, and this is a, a really an overlooked um, group of women who have experienced child abuse and domestic violence, um, where, we, where we see some attention being paid to complex trauma. It's primarily in the context of psychological research um, and also some work around um, psychological treatment for complex trauma. Um, but the dissociative disorders in particular is, is, is broadly overlooked in psychology and also I think in mental health practice. Um, and when, when you sit down and you speak to women with complex trauma and dissociation about their lives, they talk about, um, you know, really quite an extensive history of victimization, um, beginning typically in, in early childhood and continuing to the present continuing to present day. And so, you know, a strong focus of my research is on the criminal offences that, um, that cause complex trauma and dissociation, and also the failure of um, the criminal justice system and other services and agencies to, to meet the needs um, of women and kids um, that have had these experiences. And so this, this means that I work quite closely with mental health practitioners and trauma specialists um, I sit on the board of directors of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Association. Um, and so this is the, the premier global clinical network that develops um, treatment guidelines um, for the treatment of complex trauma and association. So, um, you know, mental health practitioners are really, really important um, colleagues of mine, even though I, I'm quite focused on the underlying criminal offences. So um, it was a couple of years ago um, where a group of us came together to develop um, an interdisciplinary project to look at this group of women that we felt were being um, somewhat marginalised in um, contemporary Australian mental health practice. Um, and they were also a group that we felt weren't having their safety needs being met. They were often quite vulnerable to ongoing violence and abuse. Um, and uh, and we had concerns that 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 those those issues weren't being adequately uh, addressed either. So, um, what I'm going to speak uh, to today, this this data um, 
the, the presentation is based on. It's drawn from an AMROS funded study that has only just completed. Um, and I do want to emphasize that the findings that I present today are sort of indicative findings. We've, we've submitted a draft of the research report, but it's going through the review process at the moment. The report's called the Constructions of Complex Trauma and Implications for Women's Wellbeing and Safety from Violence. So this has been a two-year and multi-method study um, focused particularly on New South Wales and Queensland. And the study really asks, you know, how is trauma and complex trauma, how is it understood in Australian public policy, but also how is it being understood and experienced by women and by service providers? Um, and so the, the project progressed in a number of key stages. So we undertook a review of um, references to complex trauma in national, state and territory policy frameworks. Um, this was probably one of the fastest pieces of research I've ever undertaken because there's very little substantive reference to complex trauma in public policy frameworks. And that's quite an important finding for us because what we found was tremendous passion and, and interest in the issue of complex trauma uh, amongst affected women and also amongst a broad range of service providers and, um, and service contexts. So tremendous passion and interest and, and a sense that complex trauma is really sitting at the heart of, of many um, social problems in Australia. And yet that passion has not translated, it has not filtered up to public policy makers. Um, they're not specifically naming complex trauma as a distinct area of professional practice or as a particular problem for us in, in Australia. It's just not being, it's not being named. We also undertook interviews with uh, 41 women with complex trauma in New South Wales and Queensland. Um, we began um, by um, speaking to services that were in contact with women with complex trauma um, and we encouraged them to distribute um, information about the study to women who could then contact us. Um, we got some response from this, um, and but not as many women as we were hoping for. So we then advertised broadly on social media, so on Facebook and Twitter. And in a very short period of time, in a couple of days, we were inundated by thousands and thousands of requests from women who wanted to talk about complex trauma and they wanted to be interviewed. So we went from a bit of a challenge with recruitment where we weren't getting enough responses by recruiting through services to then being inundated by many, many women who um, really wanted to tell their stories to us about what it's like to live with, with complex trauma. Um, and I think that gives you a good sense um, of, of just the level of awareness and concern um, amongst women who experience trauma and dissociation. Um, so we interviewed 41 women across New South Wales and Queensland, um, quite a diverse group of women, um, uh, some Aboriginal women, but not, it was only a couple of women self-identified as Indigenous. And I should say from the outset um, of the presentation that um, our project and our findings, I think, will have relevance for Aboriginal women and for services that are um, working with Aboriginal women. However, um, our research team was um, almost all white. We had no Aboriginal researchers on, on the team. Um, and we did some work with Aboriginal community controlled services in the first year of the project and really came to a consensus position that um, it is Aboriginal scholars and clinicians who are um, designing and driving research and intervention in complex trauma. Um, and there is fantastic research that's been ongoing um, in that space by Aboriginal services and, um, and professionals um, over the last two or three decades. So, um, so this, this project um, may have relevance to work with Indigenous clients, but it is not intended to speak to the Indigenous experience. Uh, and that's something that we unpack a little bit further in, in the report. Um, so um, women came from a range of socioeconomic backgrounds, a range of um, ethnic um, and um, cultural backgrounds. Um, we specifically recruited uh, for women in regional and rural areas of the state, as well as um, as well as um, women who, who lived in, in cities. Um, and we had quite a strong 
a group of women, particularly refugee women. We had quite a strong uh, degree of involvement from refugee women. So we're going to do a bit more work um, now that the report is in to actually unpack some of the refugee data because there was quite a lot of it. Um, we also interviewed, we did interviews and focus groups with 63 professionals in New South Wales and Queensland right across a range of sectors. So not just mental health, but also alcohol and drug, child protection, sexual assault, domestic violence, um, homelessness, um, also um, legal um, services as well. And then what we did was we took the, um, the findings of the study and we took them back to um, the participants. So we did uh, two online workshops with women and also um, five online workshops with professionals to help us. We presented them with the, the data and then they provided reflections on policy and practice. Um, a really nice part of the, um, the this process was at the end of the two workshops with women with complex trauma, they had the opportunity to write a message um, to professionals who work in this area. And then when we did the workshops with professionals, they had the opportunity to write a message back to women with complex trauma. And it was actually just a really touching, moving part of the research. And I'll close the workshop today, the webinar today, just by presenting you with one of the, um, one of the messages from, from women. So the report's coming out um, hopefully early next year. Um, it's focused on divergent understandings of trauma and complex trauma. Um, we didn't actually define uh, what complex trauma was in this project because we wanted to know how women define it and we wanted to know how service providers are defining it. And we'll get into that in more detail in a sec. Um, we look at the experience of women with complex trauma in health settings, also criminal justice and legal settings, welfare and family law settings. Um, and uh, there's a chapter of the project looking at the management of vicarious trauma for professionals um, who are working with complex trauma. So I'm not going to focus on that particularly today, but um, one of our investigators was Jackie, Dr. Jackie Burke, who's a specialist in the management of vicarious trauma in service context. So she did a lot of work looking at how um, workers are impacted by their complex trauma work. And then um, we've drawn together what we see as some best practice models of care for women with complex trauma, um, and not just best practice in mental health, but we were looking for models of care that are transposable across legal settings, welfare settings, um, a, a, a range of different contexts. And I do want to emphasize that really we learned a lot from sectors that are already, already modeling forms of best practice. Um, so we saw fantastic, really innovative and exciting work being done in women's health, in community health, in Indigenous health, um, also in sexual assault, um, women's legal services and the refugee sector. So, um, so we learnt a lot from, I think, the practice wisdom of the professionals who, who engaged with us. And I think um, we can really take some of those learnings out into mainstream settings and think about how they can be integrated in a way that's protective and supportive of women with complex trauma and their kids, not just in terms of their health and their welfare, but also their safety and their protection from violence. So just to give a bit of um, a backdrop, um, when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about psychological injury. We're talking about experiences that people accrue in their life that hurt their mind and result in prolonged psychological distress. So the concept of trauma has always been a bit of a controversial one in Western mental health and Western psychiatry because our dominant view of mental distress in Western medicine, it's a biomedical one that focuses on um, mental disease and psychological disease. So. Traditionally in Western psychiatry, if someone is evincing psychological distress, the view is that there is something wrong with them, they are mentally ill, um, but a trauma-informed perspective would suggest that some or many people evincing psychological distress, um, it's not that there's something wrong with them, but that something has happened to them. Um, and so today, I think we, we live with these parallel and contradictory understandings of psychological 
distress and psychological disorder. One is a mental illness model and one is a mental injury model. Nonetheless, there's broad recognition that exposure to psychological trauma is a general risk factor for a range of negative life outcomes, not just negative psychological and mental health outcomes, but also negative physical health outcomes um, and other forms of psychosocial and behavioural um, uh, issues. Now, if we measure rates of trauma in the population, what we find is that generally trauma is quite common. So in the Australian population, lifetime trauma exposure amongst women is around 74%. So three quarters of Australian women have had an exposure in their life to an event that we would understand to be a possible cause of ongoing psychological distress and, and injury. And when we measure um, trauma quite bluntly in terms of just lifetime exposure, this is equivalent to men. So men also, about three quarters of men, um, have some lifetime trauma exposure. But women and men's trauma is different. So if we look at the epidemiology of trauma, and I'm referring to the social patterning and the general social distribution of trauma, men and women have, broadly speaking, different experiences of trauma. So some similarities, but considerable differences. So men's trauma is more likely to occur later in life. It is more likely to be physical in nature. It is considerably less likely to take the form of sexual trauma. Um, it is less likely to be committed by someone who is who the boy or the man loves or is dependent on. It is more likely to occur um, outside the context of intimate relationships, um, on the street, in the pub, and it's more likely to take the form of a single incident. But in contrast, women's trauma is more likely to be repeated. So it's more likely to take place multiple times. It's more likely to be violating. So the woman experiences a sense of betrayal um, and the invasion of physical and psychological boundaries. And it's more likely to be quite frightening and scary. So women have a higher prevalence compared to men of interpersonal trauma. So two thirds of child sexual abuse victims are girls. Um, over the age of 18, 90% of um, sexual assault uh, victims are female. And we know that the most serious and injurious forms of intimate partner violence occur predominantly to heterosexual women. Um, they make up the, the largest, just numerically, the largest cohort of victims of serious, frightening, controlling violence in intimate relationships. And also stalking. Um, so repeated unwanted contact and monitoring um, is much more common amongst women. But also multi-victimisation is quite common. So if women are reporting one of these forms of, um, of violence, then they're very likely to be reporting more than one. And in fact, one quarter of all women in Australia who report any experience of violence have experienced at least three different forms of, intimate, of, of interpersonal victimisation. So that's normally child sexual abuse, sexual assault and domestic violence. And so we see the way that violence and trauma starts to accumulate over the course of someone's life. So post-traumatic stress disorder is the psychological diagnosis that was first formulated in 1980 to give some psychiatric label to the experience of trauma. And the great irony of PTSD is that it was created in 1980 to describe the psychological condition of men returning from the Vietnam War. But if you take the criteria for PTSD and you apply it to the community, you diagnose far more women than men. And this is a good indication, as feminist theorists observed in the 1980s, that women are fighting a different type of war. They're fighting a war at home rather than a war overseas. So two to three times the prevalence of PTSD amongst women compared to men. So about 10% of Australian women will meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. This is about twice the rate of Australian men. Now, in the early 1990s, we saw um, emerging out of feminist psychology, particularly the work of Judith Herman, 
um, but also psychiatric research um, with um, severely traumatised groups in the 1980s, we see the emergence of a concept of complex trauma. Um, so complex trauma um, generally refers to the, the broad symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, so that includes um, anxiety, depression, it includes intrusive trauma symptoms like nightmares and flashbacks. Um, but complex trauma also refers to the changes in um, people's understanding of themselves and their world that comes about through prolonged exposure to abuse and, and violence. Um, and it, it, complex trauma often goes along with or it goes um, hand in hand with dissociation. So complex trauma is much more common in, in women, about, um, about uh, 30 per cent of women with post-traumatic stress disorder have what we would call complex trauma. Now, trauma is quite marginalised in the Australian public health system. If for somebody with psychological trauma, it's quite difficult to get access to effective treatment. And so we see the majority of people with trauma related psychological problems um, will, um, uh, will essentially be self managing. Um, they will be trying to cope with it in, in their life. Um, there are so there, where, where we look at where the bulk of um, public investment in trauma research and treatment has gone. It's been funded by the Department of Veteran Affairs um, and it's been focused on the, um, the rehabilitation of, um, of people serving in the military. There's been some expanded service provision to first responders like police. Um, and like ambulance drivers. But what we see is that, again, these are people who are traumatised in the context of professional settings. Some programs offered for people traumatised over the age of 18 by car accidents and so on. Um, but very few publicly funded services offer long-term trauma treatment for child abuse or for domestic violence. Um, and of course, um, this is, um, these are issues that predominantly uh, affect uh, women and, and kids. So in the Australian context, trauma treatment has been highly skewed towards men. And, and it means that women with complex trauma um, are a group um, that, um, yeah, as I mentioned, is doing a lot of self-management, um, a lot of attempts to um, figure out how to live with complex trauma in, in the absence of effective care and support. So that's really what was the, the driving force behind our, our project. Um, so I should mention, um, as I'm speaking uh, this afternoon, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to type them in um, and uh, I'll try and answer them as I go. Um, or um, if it's more appropriate, I'm, I might leave it to the end of the um, session. But I, I will leave um, some, um, some space at, at, the end of the, um, at the end of the hour for, for any questions or, or comments. So we asked women, uh, what does trauma mean to you? And what does complex trauma mean to you? Because we know what the clinical picture looks like. We know what the psychological liter liter literature tells us. Um, and as I mentioned, a strong focus on anxiety, strong focus on depression, on flashbacks, problems with sleeping, um, hypervigilance, uh, and then the complex trauma picture, adding in um, problems with self-identity, problems with relationships with others, difficulties with emotional regulation, um, and also dissociation where women um, may be experiencing problems, um, integrating daily experience into one sort of continuum. Um, there may be alterations to their memory, to their identity, to their sense of self. So we asked women, um, we asked women, so what does trauma mean to you? What does complex trauma mean to you? And one of the criticisms of trauma discourse, particularly from, um, from uh, clinicians from other um, cultural backgrounds, from non-Western backgrounds, is that the psychological discourse of trauma is pathologizing and it's individualistic. Um, it doesn't acknowledge that many people live in a cultural context where they experience the impact of trauma socially and relationally. But actually what we found was that women, when women spoke to us about trauma, they emphasised the multiple impacts of complex trauma, not just the psychology of trauma, but its physical impacts, 
its impacts on their relationships and also on their spiritual well-being, but they talked about it in the context of their families and communities and across generations. Complex trauma was very much a relational experience for, for, for women. So even those, those individual psychological effects like depression, anxiety and flashbacks, women discussed these in relation to their roles as mothers, daughters, community members and, and workers. So this is an example. This is Piper. Um, we interviewed Piper. She was an Anglo-Australian woman in her 50s. Um, but in her early 40s, she experienced what she described as a mental breakdown. Um, as she began to remember being sexually abused as a child, she hadn't recalled this before. Um, and so she'd been amnestic for sexual abuse. Uh, and it, it returned in her early 40s. And so this was a really difficult period. She couldn't sleep. Um, she was having nightmares. She was experiencing a lot of chronic psychosomatic pain. Um, she was really hypervigilant and she, she had to stop working for a while. And she needed, she, she had kids, so she needed to explain to her family and her friends what was going on. And this was quite difficult for Piper. Um, she'd grown up with domestic violence. Her father was quite violent. And so the, the culture of her family was very much about keeping family difficulties behind closed doors and that it was the role of, um, uh, it was the role of family members to just pull themselves together. And that really shaped how Piper's family ex responded to her disclosure of sexual abuse. So Piper says, my mother's thing was, we'll just get over it. You've got to pull yourself together. And I said, mum, I need you to understand that I've got complex PTSD. And I think that took a lot. It was hard for her. It was hard even for my sisters to comprehend what that means. And so we get a sense here, firstly, of the intergenerational transmission of trauma, the way in which Piper's experience of domestic violence as a child, um, I mean, firstly, it, it put her at risk of sexual abuse because she was running away from home to escape a violent father, which is why she was then set vulnerable to sexual abuse outside the home. But then it's 40 years later where this trauma recurs, not only through what she describes as this mental breakdown, but then through her inability to access support and care from her family because her family even 40 years later has still been shaped by the long-term effects of her father's domestic violence um, when we interviewed workers um, you know the, the the professionals that we spoke to were incredibly passionate um, about complex trauma and i mentioned that at the start of the session they were really knowledgeable about it um, but when we asked them about complex trauma, they focused particularly on the psychological aspects of complex trauma. But women spoke at least as much about the physical effects of trauma. Um, they talked about their bodies um, that were tight, so a lot, of, um, a lot of tight muscles that couldn't relax. Um, their bodies were sore. They talked about a lot of psychosomatic pain that they attributed to um, to trauma and bodies that were tired because they couldn't sleep properly they found it really difficult to relax and they'd been often been presenting in healthcare settings talking about this pain uh, this physical pain for a long time but even when they were receiving trauma-informed treatment um, the issue was that actually their physical pain wasn't being addressed so Jill said, just being someone who's gone through trauma, you just go through so much pain physically, you've got so much muscle tension. And Carol, Carol said, well, the trauma part, it's very profound at the moment because this pain I've had has just been excruciating and there's no physical reason for it. And Madeline said, I've had a lot of pain throughout my life and a lot of fatigue, like what my occupational therapist describes as, as chronic fatigue. So like adrenal exhaustion. So Madeline's describing a body that has been so stressed and anxious for so long um, that in a sense, her, um, her sort of physiological system is just starting to tire out, is starting to wear out. So institutional betrayal was a really useful term for us when we were trying to understand women's encounters with services because women were reporting and recording over the course of their life multiple interactions 
with agencies that were ostensibly tasked to provide them with help um, and were failing to do so. And this represented a burden of additional compounded trauma for them. So th this concept of institutional betrayal, it was it's given to us by Jennifer Fried, who's a psychology professor in the United States. And what Fried found in her work is that for, for people who have been traumatized, so particularly um, sexual trauma, people who have been traumatized who then reach out for help and they are blamed or disbelieved by the institution that they ask for help, those people have worse trauma, worse trauma symptoms than people who don't ask for help. What she found is that you are better off being traumatized and not asking for help than being traumatized and asking and the institution that you ask betrays you because the betrayal increases the effect of trauma. So she calls this institutional betrayal. And this really described um, women's experiences um, encountering services. That's not to say that this was all of their experiences of services and agencies, but it was a very dominant theme. Um, and by and large, this was supported and endorsed by the professionals. They felt that the service responses to women with complex trauma were very inconsistent and unreliable. That just because a woman got a good response in one agency or from one professional, it was no guarantee that she would get the same good response from an, even another professional in the same agency. So women said that service provision was fragmented, it was difficult to access, it was often humiliating. Um, and one of the problems that women ran into consistently was um, sexist stereotypes about women's mental health. So culturally, we have quite pervasive ideas about crazy women. Um, so women who are just crazy, they're nuts, they can't, they can't be helped. And so women encountered this stereotype or this label um, from police, um, from child protection services, it, they, uh, you know, a whole range of agencies. Um, but it was particularly problematic in the mental health context because psychiatrists have a label for crazy women and that label is borderline. And so any woman who is presenting with a history of self-harm and significant ongoing high level psychological distress that is not responding to short-term interventions or treatment um, is, is likely to be diagnosed as, as borderline. Um, and so uh, almost every woman that we interviewed had, had received a borderline diagnosis. Uh, and the problem with this is that it, it, it was not resulting in a referral to effective treatment. Um, it, it was essentially being used as a clinical insult. So a trauma counsellor reflects on this dynamic here and she says, look, psychiatrists are so fond of diagnosing. Those diagnoses are often from the DSM, um, which many of you will be familiar with as sort of the formal set of categories of psychiatric illness that we, we use in Australia and also in the United States. So she says there's no complex tra trauma in the DSM. So there's no diagnosis of complex trauma. Uh, in the DSM, although there is quite a lot of agitation for its inclusion, and it has been included in other diagnostic manuals in, in Europe. So she says what psychiatrists are diagnosing people with is that there's something wrong with them. So they get a personality disorder. They're not being asked, they're not being told, oh, something happened to you. So many people did so many things to you. And it, each part of you reacted differently to protect you. And that's normal. And let's work with that. Now, early intervention and support was rare. So women were often engaged in quite early, um, <coughs> excuse me, quite early healthcare seeking. They were looking for support um, and they weren't receiving it. And what it meant was that their needs were often escalating to a crisis point. And then they were presenting in a range of settings in crisis, which makes it very difficult to present well. Um, and often the onus was on women to present well in order to receive a supportive or a protective um, response 
from different agencies. But when you're in crisis, it's pretty hard to, to, to look good. Um, so this is, um, this is a quote from Kerry. Um, Kerry has a really, really shocking trauma history, like most of the women that we, that we spoke to. Um, she lived in a, in a regional area um, where she had really minimal access to health services and mental health services. So she'd been escalating over a number of years. Um, and so in this excerpt, she describes um, getting to a crisis point and she actually walks into the reception of her local regional hospital. And on her mobile phone, she's got the number of the electoral office of the health minister. And she dials the electoral office of the health minister and she says, um, if I don't get assessed by a psychiatrist now, I'm going to kill myself. Um, now, she'd made many efforts for a psychiatric assessment. She'd been unable to access one. Um, and it was only because she emotionally blackmailed the health minister that she was able to get psychiatric assessment very quickly. Um, but Kerry has now been provided with brokerage funds. So the health department actually has funds to fly Kerry every month for specialist treatment in her local capital city and they pay for accommodation, they pay for travel and they pay for specialist inpatient care. And she only got that because she took this really drastic measure. Now, some women's encounters with services were so re-traumatizing and dehumanizing, they discussed not reaching out for help again. Um, this was a really, um, I have to say for us as researchers, this was one of the most traumatizing parts of the research. Um, so Josephine was one of three women that we interviewed um, who had um, approached uh, emergency departments in a hospital because she needed to be stitched up after self-harm. And she was one of three women, um, sorry, she was one of three women that was stitched up without an anesthetic um, and uh, who was told, you know, and, and some of the women were told we're doing this to teach you a lesson. And we also had professional participants. So some of the work interviews that we did, um, we had a couple of workers who had actually observed these incidents where self-harming women were stitched up without an anesthetic. So, I mean, this is an, really an extraordinary and gross breach of medical ethics. Uh, and so Josephine said, I had a limited episode with the hospital. I had to go to get my wrist stitched up. I was treated ridiculously bad. They hurt me a lot. They didn't bo bother with anesthetic and they treated me like I was a piece of trash. They were so resenting of having to spend their time stitching me up. They just didn't take any care. And I wouldn't treat an animal like that, let alone a person. And we actually had another woman say, you know, in interview, say, well, look, if I self-harm again, I'll never, um, I'll never reach, I'll never ask for medical attention again because of what happened in, in hospital. So the professionals actually had, a, the professionals that we interviewed had a really good understanding of the way that the service system was working and the way that it fa was, was failing women with complex trauma. And in particular, it was about the ways in which services were being tasked to meet one issue or one area of need. And once a client presented with multiple needs, they were being deemed too complex and too difficult. So this um, worker in the homelessness sector said the service sector is built in such a way where people focus on a particular issue. So as you add more and more presenting complex issues that an individual is facing, the smaller and smaller the amount of services are there that can support that individual, which makes access very hard. The more complex issues you start adding into that mix, suddenly you get to a position where there's no services that can tackle every, every single one of those presenting needs, which in itself is re-traumatizing. You get to this thing where there's nothing left and you just can't address it. So many women had the experience of having both an alcohol and drug problem and a mental health problem and a housing problem. But um, when they went to a, an alcohol and drug service, they were told, you've got a mental health issue, you need to deal with that first. When they went to a mental health service, they were told, you've got an alcohol and drug problem, you need to deal with that first. And then they were struggling to get and hold supported accommodation because they had both alcohol and drug and mental health issues. That was a very common um, issue for, for, for women. 
And so we saw, when we spoke to women, we, we took these life histories in which we see multiple experiences of abuse and violence, but the abuse and the, and the violence, it was interwoven with these failures of responses where there were multiple opportunities for a supportive intervention in the lives of these women and these interventions were being missed. And then the way in which women and kids cope with institutional betrayal um, also becomes um, part of the complexity of this situation. So Louise was one of our interviewees. She's a health worker. Um, and I should mention that, that a lot of the professionals that we interviewed had histories of complex trauma. And a lot of the women with complex trauma that we interviewed are currently working in health and welfare um, context. So there was a strong overlap between the, 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 in, the populations we're interviewing. So she's a health worker. Um, she's recently been diagnosed with a, with a, dissoci a severe dissociative disorder. Um, she grew up in a family where sexual abuse was just very common. Um, she was um, abused in the production of child sexual abuse material. Um, she was sexually exploited by her parents who sold her to, to um, people outside the family. So she had a really shocking early childhood. Um, so she grew up and she left home, <coughs> but um, she entered into a relationship in her 20s. She married a man who was, was really violent. So she says, my marriage, it was a domestic violence marriage. And because of the violence, but also my dissociation. So every time my husband hurt me, he would hit me and then I would dissociate and I would become very sick. And my daughter, who was very young, she, she had to take care of me. I remember many nights. I remember watching myself. I was in a dissociative state. I remember watching my daughter washing me and showering me and feeding me. And she was only six. So that's what I'm saying. That's the effect that it had on, on my kids. Um, so L Louise was able to leave her violent husband, um, but she couldn't cope as a solo mum. She didn't have enough support and her kids were taken into care for periods of time. Um, and so, you know, Louise has a lot of regrets about um, her parenting and she talks to her kids a lot about, um, about their, their early childhood. Um, but today her adult daughter won't leave her own abusive relationship and she won't seek help for domestic violence because she was removed and she's scared that her own children will be removed. So Louise, this is Louise recounting a, a conversation with her daughter. And she said, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've put you through. I'm sorry about the effect that it had on you. And it has, my daughter herself is in a bad relationship. And even though I say to her so many times, you need to get help for yourself. She's seen me at a very young age, taken away in paddy wagons. She gets taken off by docks. So I say, you need to get help. And all she'll say to me is, if I do that, I'll lose my kids. That's what I'm saying. That's the effect of trauma. That's how it continues into generations. It hasn't just affected my life. It's affected my daughters. So we can see the legacy here, the intergenerational legacy of institutional betrayal and failure that Louise and her daughter carry with them today, you know, from, from 40 years ago. And I would suggest that many of the attitudes that, that meant that Louise didn't receive a supportive intervention when she was a child or a young woman are still with us today. And that's quite evident in Louise's own experiences. Um, Louise is an advocate for the rights of complex trauma. And she's, she's describing um, a conversation that she's had in her own workplace. So she said, I had one manager from one hospital say to me, when you guys, so they, they mean women with complex trauma, when you're a bit sad and you come into the emergency department, it takes so much effort for my staff to make you happy when there's real patients out there and real problems and all you are doing is taking up my time. So I want to focus now on the, um, the, the experience of women that were getting a really good um, response. Um, and so th there was a small group of women that we encountered who found themselves in context where they were receiving holistic care. So they, they didn't simply have, for example, a trauma specialist therapist, which is a great step forward. It's, it's quite hard to get access to trauma specialist therapy in, in Australia. 
they, but they didn't just have, they were just receiving um, trauma therapy, but they were getting all of their needs met. And that included physical health issues, psychosocial issues. Um, it included um, support around just the complexities of their life as someone with complex trauma. So this is Madeline. Um, and Madeline was having basically a, a great experience um, of the service that she's in at the moment. Um, it's a recovery oriented mental health service that takes a small number of cases and then works with them intensively over two or three years to essentially promote autonomy and resilience. And for Madeline, this was an absolute sea change in her life. And she talked in an interview just about what it was like to feel herself getting better and to feel more hopeful and positive after a long time of, of really struggling. So she says, I was on a wait list for the service. I was triaged to see them between the ages of 14 and 22. It wasn't until suicide attempt number seven that they said, well, now you're on top of the triage and we'd like to help you. Their help has been excellent. So there's been some clinicians, they didn't work for me in the service, but mostly it's been excellent. Um, because if, if Madeline didn't build a rapport with one clinician in the service, that wasn't a disaster. There were other people that she could work with. Um, she wasn't just getting psychotherapy, and in fact, she gets psychotherapy outside this service, but she was being provided with other modalities of treatment. Um, so dialectic behavioral therapy, conversational models of therapy. So she could actually play around with different models of treatment that that she clicked with and they listened to her about what was working for her. She also has an occupational therapist that helps with some of the sensory processing issues that she experiences from trauma. And she has a case manager and she says she's like the best social work ever. She helps with things like fill out Centrelink and NDIS paperwork. So a lot of women that we interviewed were intersecting with simultaneously with five or six different services, different systems. So it might be family law, it might be child protection, it might be mental health, it might be alcohol and drug and public health at the same time. And one of the issues for them was they couldn't cope with the administrative burden of interfacing with all of these systems on their own. So Madeline has a case manager and that case manager helps her cope with all of this. And in fact, um, uses um, uh, uses the complexity of some of these systems as a therapeutic tool to help Madeline assert herself and assert her rights. So she, she says, they've been brilliant. They've been able to connect me with other resources. They are familiar with the patchwork of inadequate services. Um, they know where to refer you and things like that. So we saw this holistic model, not just in mental health settings, we saw it um, in um, uh, we saw it in legal settings, we saw it in welfare services, we saw it in um, domestic violence and sexual assault services. Um, and so we, we tried to draw out um, some of the, the key learnings around what we think are best practice models that we should be endorsing um, and we should be promoting, not just at the level of services, but we should be endorsing um, at a public policy level, we should be saying to public policy makers, this is the right approach. So firstly, there should be no wrong door for women with complex trauma, and it should be easy for women with complex trauma to enter into service systems. Um, even if they, they don't necessarily step through the door that's right for them at that time, there is um, good supportive non-judgmental referral pathways. Um, services and systems have a whole of life, whole of person perspective. Um, people's current presentation, their current level of need is framed by a holistic view of women's experiences and women's whole selves that acknowledge how their own histories influence their expectations and their interactions with services. Safety first, so including safety from perpetrators, but also um, security in terms of housing, security in terms of food. Um, women can't possibly recover from complex trauma unless they're safe and secure in a range of ways. But services also need to feel safe. 
So the physical design of, of the service needs to be safe, but also the culture of the service needs to be safe. So very clear boundaries and clear communication with women about what the service can and can't offer and what everyone's roles are. But within those clear boundaries, um, services need to be flexible. They need to be able to accommodate the needs of women with complex trauma. Um, if women are struggling with unpredictable psychosomatic pain and fatigue and insomnia and depression, then they may make a, an appointment and have every intention of keeping it, but that morning they're unable to get out of bed, for example. Um, or um, crises might escalate very suddenly um, out of hours. So the service system needs to be able to accommodate that in a non-judgmental way that doesn't process women out of services because they're seen to be non-compliant. Non um, a really strong determinant of success that we saw across health, welfare and criminal justice was where women were able to establish a rapport with a key staff member and that, that connection endures over time. Um, and it becomes a way in which decisions about what's happening with the woman is, is made in consultation with the woman or is just clearly and honestly communicated by someone that she, she trusts. And we need stepped care. So as women's needs escalate, they receive more intensive care, but then they can be referred back to lower threshold care when they're stabilised. Um, so they're retained in care being dropped rather than being dropped out of treatment. So ideally stepped care should be available within services or through a close collaboration um, between services. Ideally services should um, involve multidisciplinary support and multiple modalities of support. So physical, psychosocial, mental health, practical life challenges, incorporating cultural knowledge cultural safety, cultural expertise where that's necessary. Um, and particularly in mainstream services, working with women with complex trauma, the role of um, Aboriginal liaison staff was, was really critical and something that was really emphasised by professional, by professional interviewees. Case management and advocacy, clients need to be supported to navigate complex and challenging systems. And we often found that in the absence of case management, therapists and counsellors didn't have time to work with women's mental health needs. They were too busy acting as de facto case managers to sort out critical issues around housing and so on. And then some practical accommodation of the client's needs. So a need for brokerage, funds or other provisions in place to address issues with childcare. You know, how, how can women participate in some of these services when they have child rearing responsibilities? What about transport issues? You know, women talked about receiving trauma treatment and feeling really discombobulated and unsafe, but then having to catch public transport or having to drive an hour back home while they're feeling really um, dissociated or disturbed in some way. But also, um, you know, some services were able to accommodate parenting and you and promote good parenting as part of the service and really engage with women's relationships with their kids, um, which was really um, really crucial in terms of heading off child protection issues and unnecessary child protection interventions. And last but certainly not least, um, investment in staff care and support and vicarious trauma prevention. Um, if, if services and the service system is traumatising workers, then it's going to traumatise women. We need to make sure that people who are working with trauma survivors um, feel safe and feel well and feel supported and then we're able to bring women into an environment that already has those characteristics. Um, but women are very sensitised to environments that are, um, you know, that, that are inadequate in terms of meeting people's needs. So staff needs have to be met. That's a very important part of vicarious trauma prevention. So before um, I finish up and we um, take some time for questions, um, you know, we, we, we spoke uh, with 
professionals quite a lot about vicarious trauma and about the, the risks of being involved um, in working with complex trauma clients. And it was really interesting in one of our workshops, you know, a professional uh, said to us, you know, I'm sick and tired of everyone talking about how complex trauma work is draining and horrible and, and difficult. And she said, I love working with women with complex trauma. She said it's incredibly rewarding and meaningful. And that made us go back and reanalyze our interviews. And we found like, when we pulled it all out, we found six pages of, of professionals talking about how much they love doing complex trauma work. So, you know, this work isn't just about vicarious trauma, it's also about vicarious resilience. It's also about the ways in which those of us who work with women with complex trauma, we learn new strength, new skills, and we build our own resilience by learning from this population. And so this was really encapsulated in an interview we did with a women's health worker. And she said, uh, she, she talked about an experience um, of, of a conference when she just started working at the Women's Health Centre and she went to a conference and she said they were talking about vicarious trauma and the need to let go of what was taking place at work. You know, let go before you leave, um, you know, let go of, of your work and when you get home, make sure you water the garden or have a glass of wine. One of the things they said was, as you go out the door, just leave behind what's taken place. And I went to the microphone and said to them, I really love my job. I don't have to leave something behind to do the thing that I'm doing. I'm really proud of what we're doing. Uh, and I think this is something that's really important for us to hold on to in the work that we do around complex trauma um, is not just being aware of, of course, the risk of vicarious trauma, but also what, what do we learn from women with complex trauma and, and, and how do they teach us in all kinds of ways. So this, this was something that came up in, in the, the workers, the workshops that we did with, with workers when we took the data back to, to workers. They talked a lot about how much they learn from women with complex trauma. Um, and I just want to, to end the webinar um, with this statement from one of the groups of women because they, they wanted you to hear this and this is very much their message to you. Um, and they said, remember that we are here because of what happened to us and not because of what is wrong with us. My emotions might be running wild, but I'm still here and I'm an expert in my life. Instead of telling us what we need, you should ask us what we need. Trauma impacts us as a whole person, physical, mental, financial, spiritual and social. Our experience is part of a bigger picture. We need a sense of progress, safety and understanding as individuals, in services and in society. So that's it from me. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for any questions that you might have that I can briefly answer. Um, but I should say that the report um, will be publicly available um, and it will be out um, early next year, we think January. And I do want to acknowledge uh, again the, the funding from Australia's research, National Research Office for Women's Safety. Um, without them, we, we, we just couldn't have done the work.